Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh, let's give it to the Lord. 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 I think Apostle told us or taught us how we clap to the Lord. So let's do it to the Lord. Let's do it to the Lord. This morning, I'm very grateful to be here to fellowship with you. I've never been here on Sunday to minister. And it is not easy that in the Church of Pentecost, a Sunday, Lord's Supper Sunday, for example, it is easy to get a place to go and minister. And I'm very grateful for this opportunity and this honor that you have done. I'm great, very grateful to Pastor and the executives, the leadership of this assembly and district. And we say we are very grateful to be with you this morning. This morning, after the resurrection, we wanted to discuss something that relates to the Lord's Supper. Interestingly, the Lord's Supper has several compositions, and one of the neglected compositions is what we are going to discuss today. That is the cup of the Lord, his blood. Let's all say it together. Let's say it once more. Let's say it again for the third time. This morning, I brought my cup of the Lord. In the Lord's Supper, we Pentecostals, we often focus more on the emblems. We talk more about the blood. We talk more about the bread. But the cup that was lifted, little is spoken about this cup. The essence of the cup, we all need to know. So that after resurrection, we will be able to also follow the steps of Christ. And do likewise to his glory. Cup is often defined as a vessel. And when we say something is a vessel, it is a hollow receptacle. Or any container. Or any small kept shake container that can take liquids or dry materials. In scriptures, cup has a lot of divine symbols and understanding. And why Jesus related the cup to his blood. Cup, literally, in the world, may have little or very good use. As 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 to 21 tells us, that in a great house, there are many vessels, so the cup is there. Some of the cups have no use. They are useless. But some cups or vessels are useful. In the Bible, cup is often a symbol of divine retribution or God's anger and wrath. 
And this anger and wrath, God can lay it onto people. He can lay it onto nations. He can lay it onto cities. He can lay it onto tribes. He can lay it onto ungodly and godly people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 21, I'm reading from the New King James Version. The Bible says that, and I read, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and of the table of demons. It tells us that there are two types of cups in this world. The cup of the Lord, which I call his blood. And then we have the cup of demons. This morning I'm presenting the two cups to you. The cup of the Lord and then the cup of demons. God's cup, anytime it is lifted, we said that it is because of divine retribution or of God's anger and wrath. And this is laid on wicked individuals, it is laid on cities, it is laid on people, it is laid on nations. When Ghana becomes wicked, God can lift his cup against us. There are other countries in the world that God has lifted his cup against them. And they are experiencing the wrath of God from men. In Psalm 11 verse 6, it says, Upon the wicked, he, rain, he will rain coals, fire, and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. This cup, it was God that laid it against the ungodly. So the first lifting of God's cup is against the ungodly. The second lifting of God's cup, it is God uses it against nation against nation. Some nations who fight other nations. Some nations who have diseases. Some nations who have pandemics. Other nations who transfer to them. In ancient Babylonia, for example, there was a golden cup that God lifted. And when this golden cup was lifted by God, he used Babylon or Babylonia to defeat and to afflict other nations. So in Jeremiah 51 verse 7, he said, Babylon, Babylon was a golden cup. That golden cup was in the Lord's hands. That golden cup was not in Satan's hands. That golden cup was in the Lord's hand. It was the Lord that allowed Babylon to meet out afflictions to defeat nations, to make sure that these nations are conquered. The third one is that God's people against the ungodly. God told the people of Jerusalem, don't go to the inhabitants, their wedding, their funerals. Don't go there. If they are mourning, make them more afflicted. If they have mourning, 
their fathers and their mothers go and create more problems for them. God lifted his cup. We call that cup the cup of destruction against the people because they didn't want to worship and serve God. So in Jeremiah 16, 5 to 7, for this is what the Lord says, do not enter a house where there is funeral meal. Do not go to, the, to mourn or show sympathy because I have redrawn my blessing, my love, my pity from these people, declares the Lord. Both high and low, whether children or anybody at all, God ensured that they will not be buried or mourned and no one will cut themselves or shave themselves or their heads for the dead. No one will offer food to comfort those who mourn for the dead. Not even a father or a mother. Nor will anyone give them a drink to console them. This was God's lifted cup. Which is dangerous. Now let's come to Jesus. If cup is always destructive or trying to mete out punishment. Why is Jesus asking us to remember him always? Let's see Jesus. How Jesus was able to change the cup so that it became, it became the Lord's cup. Jesus' cup in Matthew 26, verse 39, Jesus prayed a prayer. Very important pr prayer that will lead us to the change of the concept of the cup. Because Jesus was accused of two things. One, he was accused of blaspheming. And two, he was accused of sedition. When we say you are blaspheming in theology, it means that speaking irreverently or disrespectful against holy things and against God. And when we say you are under sedition, it means that for you, you are rebellious. You are inciting people against the others of the town or the nation. So Jesus, the world, saw Jesus that the calf lifted against him is, a, is blasphemous and sedition. And therefore, that calf was, they are going to crucify him. But Jesus, God is not like a man that he should think the way man thinks. God's cup that he lifted for Jesus was of great concern over the reproach of his death. And this was one to take away the sins of the world. Oh, you didn't clap to the Lord. That you, I will also have my sins being taken away by the Lord. So when in Matthew chapter 26 verse 39 and Matthew chapter 26 verse 42, the second prayer that Jesus prayed, the first one is that, Lord, if it is possible, take this cup over me. Take this cup over me, but not my will, but your will. Let your will be done. Always the will of the Lord must be done. The second prayer that Jesus prayed in Matthew 26 verse 42, the second time he went away and prayed saying, Oh my father, if this cup cannot, cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, 
Jesus will drink in the cup. Jesus will drink that cup. Whether that cup is blasphemous or sedition, he is ready to drink it. And the drinking of that cup is because he was obeying the Father's will. The will of God transcends above our personal desires and will. God's will must always be established. God's will must always be the one that we must all focus on. So God's assigned portion or cup for Jesus was meant only for him to suffer and to be glorified. And then Jesus was to be baptized unto death. And this is what climax the, the resurrection. And it brought about Jesus. So the Bible mentions six things that Jesus' resurrection has brought about. Six things that the cup that Jesus picked, Jesus was able to turn that cup. He turned it because he was baptized. And in the baptism, Luke says, Luke 12, verse 50 says that, but I have a baptism to be baptized with. How distressed I am till it is accomplished. That baptism is empowerment from the Holy Spirit. It is restoration of God's love. It is restoration of the power and the anointing upon the life of Jesus. So that Jesus will be able to go to the cross and die and, be, and resurrect. So that he will be able to shame all the enemies and conquer Satan. So the Bible says that there are six things that the resurrection of Jesus uh, had given us. The first thing that the resurrection of Jesus has given us is that the cup that Jesus meted out has been changed. The first cup is called the cup of his covenant. So Jesus turned the cup and changed it into a cup of his covenant. And that covenant is an agreement between we and Christ that we must always do this and then we will remember him. So the, the cup of the Lord is now being changed. So six basic ways that his blood has been described by the Bible after Jesus' resurrection. The first one is the cup of the Lord. When we say the cup of the Lord, the Lord means in Greek, it comes from the Greek word we call kurios. The old, in Cyrillic language, we use kairios. U is replaced by Y. So that word means that someone you must never say no to. The Lord is always your master. The second one is that the cup becomes the cup of suffering. If you are a Christian, you must have good days, you have bad days. You must be ready to endure suffering. You must be ready to endure tests and afflictions. Don't know that or don't think that you continue to have life easy. You must always be ready that when suffering comes, I am ready. The third one is that the cup becomes a cup of blessing. Blessing. Every bitter end, there is a sweet end awaiting. So if you are in Christ, and then you go through bitterness, you go through suffering, you go through this and that, one day the Lord's blessings will come. The blessings will come as happiness, they will come as joy, they will come as material blessing. The fifth one is the cup of salvation. This is very important because Peter said in Acts chapter 4 of verse 12 that there is no salvation in any other name except in Christ Jesus. The Lord's Supper itself does not save. You cannot eat the Lord's Supper and become saved or go to heaven. No. The Lord's Supper only adds to our salvation. It is only Jesus who saves. So Jesus, his blood that he shed for us, that is the real blood that saved you. 
and saved us and kept us going. So salvation is of the Lord. In Psalm 116 verse 13, it says, I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. The last one is that the cup of God's new covenant sealed with his blood. I've explained here before that in this world, if people are making agreements in the courts, you need a seal, a stamp, a signature. The way the world is today, if Jesus had not sealed the agreement, people would not believe him. So Jesus, knowing all things, knows that. One day, Thomas will again say that this man has deceived us. Peter will also say that he doesn't know me. And it will be, Judas will still be selling him. So this time, Jesus decided that I'm going to turn friends to the agreement. I will not make it verbal. And I'm going to use my blood to seal it. In this country, even a, 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 a president one day uses his, his blood to seal his own party's flag. If Christ is sealing, he is sealing for eternity. And Jesus' seal is an agreement of truth. It is not an agreement of denial. So if you are holding on to this Jesus, then you will be able to do. So that is why he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, that the pastor read, that we must drink it. This Lord's cup is his blood. We must drink it and do this in remembrance on him, for him or of him. We need to understand that because the Lord's table or Lord's cup surpasses all, we have a lot of benefits and the Lord will always continue to bless us. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. And the Lord let his countenance shine on you. Amen.